You know, um, we've got parables to do this morning. We've got two parables in Luke about the cost of commitment. But I could not, as, as I kept putting class together, I could not escape Mark chapter 4, and I want to go there first. Even though it's not a parable, it's the story about Jesus commanding the waves and the wind to be still, and they did. But given the fact that last Sunday morning we were all somewhere else, either in our homes or evacuated to some other safe place, and we were looking out a window or we were hearing the noise of the wind come by and we were watching it increase and, and perhaps the stress level was rising a little bit or perhaps it wasn't. But uh, we saw these things happening and, and we had nobody to depend on except God. Well, who else do we need to depend on in those type of situations? And I, I can't tell you that all of my life my faith has been strong enough that I sat there and didn't worry about things that were happening outside. You know, I've tried and I've worked on it. It's an ongoing process. Uh, and sometimes my faith is stronger than it is at other times. I think probably we're all that way to some degree, but I kept thinking about Jesus in the boat. And he had been preaching, and he got in the boat to go to the other side of the, of the sea of Galilee. And what happened when he got out there in the middle was a great storm arose. And I don't know, um, there's a lot of similarities here. It, you know, we live in a place where storms come regularly, right? I mean... I used to live in Arkansas, and I cannot tell you the number of times I worried about a hurricane. It, I didn't. You know, I, I actually prayed for a hurricane to come somewhere in the Gulf Coast of Texas, not hurt anybody, but it was the only way we would get rain in the summertime. It was a hurricane come in the Gulf, spread up towards my direction, and give us a little rain that, that kind of gave a little life back to things. Now... I feel bad about that nowadays and <laughs> after having gone through them. And certainly I didn't want anybody to be hurt because of it. But all these things that we have that, that here in Florida that parallel this event, because what happens on the Sea of Galilee is that because of the topography north of the sea and the way the winds blow, the winds come down off the, off the elevations, they come straight down the the cliffs, and then they roll out across the water, and it just turns violent all of a sudden. And that's what happened on this particular night that Jesus was in the boat with his disciples. And look at Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 35. I want to read a little bit of this. <clears throat> on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and the other little boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we perish? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And then he asked the disciples, why are you so fearful? Who did they have in the boat with them? You know? And so the question has to be asked, where was their trust? If it had been on Jesus, would they have been as worried as what they were? And so we're in this storm, and we have all these thoughts running through our head. Where is our trust? You know, this was miraculous in that Jesus spoke and the wind and the waves ceased immediately. Um, how long does it take for the, the waves to calm down when you go to the ocean, when you go to the beach after a storm? It doesn't happen immediately, does it? And yet on this particular occasion, it did. And certainly we're not going to have that type of situation, but, but those disciples that were in the boat... They were safe, weren't they? Even though they didn't know they were safe, they were safe. 
and they lost focus and didn't trust in Jesus briefly. I had Jerry and then I had Fran. Um, to paraphrase Jerry's comment this way, those disciples got an eyeful of exactly the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that they didn't fully understand before, and now they do. Fran? It's a process, isn't it, Fran? Uh, it's just something to work on. Uh, we've used the analogy, the comparison before about the gas tank and you know, filling it up, going to God in prayer, studying, all those type of things. The more we do that, the more faith we put in the tank. The more faith we have in the tank, the more we need it and use it. And that's what it's there for, right? You go fill up the car with gas because you need to go somewhere. You fill up the faith tank because you need to get through life. Uh, Dirk. I almost said Darren. I'm sorry. Dirk. Two years ago, we had a storm came through and destroyed one of the trees. <clears throat> I hope everyone heard Dirk's comments. Um, they're spot on. Trials in our lives grow us as Christians. And somebody did not turn their cell phone off. Let that be a lesson to you. Oh, that's twice I think I've done that, isn't it? Well... It may not be the last time. Let's, uh, let's get into parables this morning, okay? Let's go to Luke chapter 14. And we've got two parables about counting the cost, about commitment. Um, what is the cost of discipleship? <clears throat> go with me to... Chapter 14, verse 25 of Luke. And let's read from 25 to 33. We'll read both of these parables together. Now when great multitudes went with him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, 
he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, we've got to deal with the thousand pound elephant in the room or however much the elephant weighs on the hatred part in just a second, and we will. But I want us to understand the, the parable, the main issue of the parable is the cost of commitment. What does it cost to follow Jesus? And although the circumstance here is not exactly the same as to what Jesus was preaching as it is in John chapter 6. Turn to John chapter 6 and verse 60 and look at that. And, and as Jesus was talking to the masses, there were those who said, this is tough. This is difficult. We cannot deal with this. And what does it say there? It says, many turned and did not follow anymore. Right? Or I, I paraphrased it, but you get that part. What did Jesus do early in his ministry? What did he tend to? What did he minister to? Physical needs, right? I mean, we use this as a model for missionary work today. We, we go somewhere... We, we teach and we preach, but the first thing we do is tend to physical needs. Because when we address those things and we work on those physical things, there's a door that's open to deal with the spiritual things. Right? And so Jesus was doing all these things as he went about the countryside preaching and teaching. And, his, and his, as he taught, what's going to happen to what he's teaching? as far as um, complexity, meat versus milk, that type of thing. Do you take calculus when you're in the first grade? You know, you start off slow and you work your way up, right? Some of us don't take calculus ever. Me. I could barely get, I can't do two variable equations. Um, you start off small and you work your way up and you progress into things. And as Jesus went throughout the, the countryside preaching and teaching and, he, and all these events took place and he performed miracles and he dealt with needing physical food and things of that nature, he ramped up the preaching. And as he did, people started scratching their head. They said, I'm not sure that I can deal with this. Well, then the question of that person is, are you committed? Well, are you? And many people said, no, they weren't. And so even though John 6 and 60 is not exactly, or the conversation Jesus was having in John chapter 6, verse 60 is not this parable, the point is that as we look at this and Jesus asked this question or makes this statement, you cannot follow me unless you hate your parents. Is that tough? You know, what? Does anybody in here hate their mom and dad? And, and you know, it, we can't go there. Do what, Chuck? Hmm? That don't mean hate them, it means to love them less. We'll, we'll get there, Betty. You're right, it does. Jim? Well, my same question is, uh, the word hate needs to be identified. It does, and we are going to. 
But I want to set this scene as we're talking about because the point of what we're talking about is what it costs to follow Jesus. And I don't think there's anybody in... Are y'all hearing me, by the way? We're good? Okay. Am I, I, I'm, I'm not fading in and out? That's what I hear. Um... Is there a cost to being a Christian? What is it? Hmm? Did you say suffering, Jimmy? There is some suffering. What kind of suffering? How do we suffer as a Christian? Put it, put it in real everyday terms. Do we lose friends sometimes? I'm not... How much suffering is that? Well, you know, not suffering as we saw persecution of the Christians, but is there some mental anguish? Because we're not accepted everywhere by everyone. What else? How else does it impact us, Jim? I think we suffer in in a sense of not sinning because we don't enjoy the things of the world. So therefore we bring our bodies under subjection. Jim said we suffer because we don't do those things that bring physical pleasure, if I can paraphrase that a little bit. Are there things that... I mean, i got to be careful how I ask this question. Um, There are a lot of things in this world that give us temporary enjoyment and pleasure, right? That have bad long-term detrimental effects. to do. Um, Each of us have places that we can be tempted. Things that bother me may not bother you and vice versa, right? Where is Satan going to come attack you, Dave Holliday? Don't answer the question out loud, Dave. The point is, you know where you're weak, and that's where Satan's going to attack you. And sometimes these things um, can bring us enjoyment in the short term. What else is the cost of, of, Jimmy pointed out, suffering, that we can suffer as Christians? Also, in in that respect, we see other people sinning in those areas that God forbids. We become, uh, Jim saying, we be- because we stand for something, we become enemies of those who feel otherwise. And that's a, we're seeing that more and more in everyday society today, are we not? Those who would speak out in more of a, a sense of, of anything goes, uh, and I hate to use the, uh, the liberal or conservative moniker to put on this, but those that we would consider to be left of us, politically speaking, I guess, say things that don't allow us and don't give us the opportunity to defend our faith. And it's done under the guise of tolerance. We should be tolerance of all, of all people. And because Christianity is not tolerant of sin, we become the bad guy. We know that, right? We see that pretty much every day, don't we, Jimmy? Because it's so much louder. 
All right, Jimmy's point is going to segue into the, the verse I want to go to, and let me, let me paraphrase it by saying that Jimmy feels pressure to feel a certain way that is tolerant of people while it ignores truth. Um, and then made, made to feel bad when you don't get in line and march with, with uh, the group. Go to John chapter 8, verse 31, please. <clears throat> Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you abide in my word, you are disciples indeed. Next verse. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Henry. We are, uh, we're ostracized. We are. Because we are to live in the world but not be a part of the world. And as Christians, we're set apart and we're pushed to the side. The question is, is that okay with you? Well, the answer to that is it better be. Because if it's not, then we've got a problem following Jesus. The parable is talking about a guy who built a tower and a king who looked at the cost of going to battle. Building the tower is probably talking about building the tower for a vineyard. That was a common thing to do. The vineyard owner built the tower so that he could keep watch over that things were happening within the vineyard. If somebody came in to steal the grapes, he could, he could see them. If, if you know animals came in to eat the grapes, he could see them. If, whatever the case might be. And it talks about if he starts to build the tower, he doesn't have enough money in the bank in order to finish the tower, then he's going to be the point of ridicule. So he sits down first and he says, do I have enough budget for this in order to do? Can I commit to this project? Do we do that before we start something? I think in most cases we do when it comes to those projects that we're talking about, like putting a new floor in the house, you know, or after we have a storm uh, and our wind deductible is 5%, <laughs> you know, do we have enough to put a new roof on the house or are we just going to have to live with those blue tarps for a little bit longer? Well, when it comes to being a Christian, do we just kind of float along or do we pick this up and do we understand the commitment it takes? And so when we're faced with those situations where our Christianity needs to come to the top and, and we speak truth, or do we just kind of roll along? Dave? We're told that we're going to suffer as long as we're in this Dave's point is we're going to have these temptations in our life. And I think about James, the book of James, because what does James tell us about these trials and tribulations? Those trials and tribulations are there to make us stronger Christians. If you're a jeweler and you work with precious metal, what, do you, what does it take in order to turn that raw metal into something that you can go sell for a large sum of money? Fire. Fire. Life is full of fire, isn't it? 
What are we committed to? Morris. Morris points out the short-term aspect versus the long-term aspect. There's going to be suffering. We can choose to suffer a little bit here because we may be a little bit different and have a great reward later, or we can choose to kind of move with the masses here and suffer for all eternity at some point. I don't think any of us want that very much, do we? You know? What is that cost of becoming a Christian? Is it worth it? Does it pay off in the end? Yes. You know, and the answer's got to be yes. It has to be. All right, let's talk about the hatred because we've got to get back to the hatred. All right? Jesus, how many times said, uh, love your enemies, for example? How many times are we told to honor our mom and dad? How many to- times are we told that children are blessed Unless you can be like one of these, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Then why are we hating these people? How must we hate them in order to serve God? Do what, Jerry? The key to it, Jerry's right, hate the sin, love the sinner. The key to it is in... um, uh, Verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Who am I supposed to hate in deference to God? I've got to put away me, don't I? I've got to put away the, the, the old self, put away my desires, those things that I, that I want that are all about Richard, that's what I've got to put away. That's what we're talking about, this hatred that Jesus talks about for, for mom and dad, uh, wife, brothers and sisters, children, and all that kind of thing. The word itself that's used does mean love less. It doesn't mean hate. Like I have an absolute hatred for the University of Texas football team. (laughs) And I do. And I pray for forgiveness for it. But I just can't stand them. But that's not what we're talking about, is it? Dave? God, we are all in that state now. We are all sinners here, and God sent Jesus who died for us in order to defeat Satan once and for all. Do I love Debbie? Well, I don't know, Debbie. What do you think? It, you are nodding your head, aren't you? <laughs> It's hard for me to describe how much I love my wife. But I love God more. And she's okay with that. Because she loves God more than she loves me. Because ultimately, whose soul am I responsible for and can only deal with judgment? Mine. Now, do I have a responsibility right now to however many people are in here, and can I be held responsible if I lead you astray? I most certainly can. But when it comes to me standing before God on the day of judgment, I'm only dealing with me. And when we love God more than we love our mom, our dad, our children our wife, our brothers, or our sisters, 
then everything falls into exactly the place that it should be on the hierarchy, does it not? What's Jesus saying in this first verse? Not that you're going to hate these people, but you're going to love God first and foremost. And because you love God first and foremost, then everything else is going to fall into the right place. And I'm committed to God. And it's going to cost me. Because what about that situation when your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter or whomever it might be falls away? It's tough. It's tough. Gary? Yep. Matthew chapter 16. Uh, Jim? I think verse 26 uh, is an example in, in the teaching of Paul and the apostles that the appreciation of grace. Jim talks about the appreciation of grace. Ultimately, what saves us? Can we work our way to heaven? Well, we cannot, even though our faith's got to have some of those works to go with it. Ultimately, it's that grace of God that's going to save us. Turn to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, please. <clears throat> then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Do we do that? What does it mean to deny yourself? I mean, this is what Jesus is talking about in the parable about hating mom and dad, brother, sister, husband, wife, etc. Denial of self. Putting self to the backside. Look in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is Paul speaking, and this is a very powerful scripture. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Does that answer the question about what that hatred of mom and dad and brother and sister and child and so forth is? What is the cost of our commitment to God, to Jesus? Here. Doesn't this define it? We are crucified with Christ. Our identity becomes so mixed in completely and totally with Christ that we suffer as He has suffered. We stand for those things which He stood for. We can do nothing else other than this. God's Word. All of it. Not part of it. All of it. Is that easier said than done? Is it a lifetime commitment? Does it change on a daily basis? Do you get stronger as you go? You know, what, what can we do to get to this point of Acts chapter 2 verse 20 and be like Paul and be crucified with Christ? Well, we have to commit. And whatever that means to you, however you are able to do it, you know, you can't do it without opening your Bible. You can't do it without prayer. You can't do it without meeting with the saints regularly. And all those type of things that Jesus put into place in order to give us a support network to live a life as a Christian. 
Yeah. This morning, and I, I don't know if you guys watch Phil Sanders on Sunday morning or not. Um, I don't usually catch all of it. I catch about 15 or 20 minutes of it. But he was talking today's show about the importance of communing with the saints at church, at worship, in, in a congregation. And the fact that many people in today's society believe you can be an effective Christian without attending a corporate worship service. And he pointed out the hypocrisy in that because what is this worship? What is this church? It's the bride of Christ. Who died for church? Jesus. So how can we be? How can we be truly committed as a Christian if we're not here? You know, it's all part and parcel. It's all a package deal. Dirk? We're seeking that which is on a higher plane, are we not? That of a spiritual realm. Let's finish it this way. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. What do we have in Matthew chapter 5? What is Matthew chapter 5 through 7? What is this known as? Sermon on the Mount, right? This is what we're looking at. If you did nothing other than just looked at the headings that some man put into your New Testament. Okay, these headings that are not God-inspired. If that's all you looked at in these three chapters or, uh, of this Sermon on the Mount, what do you see about living a Christian life? Love your enemies, go the second mile, marriage is sacred, do good to please God, how to pray, laying up your treasures in heaven. You cannot serve God in riches. All these things that have to do with commitment. Second bell, so you don't get to comment, I guess. We're just done. Thank you.